Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Anna, and I'm with the New Mexico Small Business Development Center. Today, we have Vic Bernaclau joining us, who is a SCORE certified mentor specializing in technology and business management. Today's presentation is part one of a two-part series titled How to Plan for a Successful Business. Part two of the series will take place next week on Thursday, September 30th at noon, and it'll cover implementation of your business plan. I'll chat the registration link through to you during the presentation so that you have that available. And um, if you wouldn't mind progressing to the COVID resources page, Vic, that would be awesome. Thank you so much. So this slide features some COVID-19 business resource links. I'm not going to go over those in detail as we'll send you a copy of those presentation slides at the end of the webinar. And just to let you know, we'll be using the Q&A function to take questions and we welcome attendee participation, so don't be shy. Um, and feel free to ask us any questions you may have. We'll answer those questions during and at the end of the webinar. And if you have any technical issues, feel free to let me know about those using the chat feature. Thanks so much for joining us. And without further ado, I'll hand it over to you, Vic. Thank you so much. Welcome everybody. Uh, if you had decided to take a vacation, say to Disneyland, would you just jump in the car and start driving somewhere? Or would you spend some time thinking about what you want to do, planning how you want to get the most out of your trip? Well, the same applies to a business, is that you wouldn't just jump into a business and say, let's just open the doors and see what happens. You'd plan that business. And that's exactly what we're going to talk about today. Welcome again. Again, my name is Vic Berniclaw. And the purpose of our get together is to examine how you can effectively plan a successful business. So let's go ahead and get started. There are a number of elements that we, we, we wanna talk about uh, in doing this. But before we do that, let's talk about putting planning in the right context. We're going to plan the business by thinking through all of the parts. And there are many, many parts, and we're gonna be talking about that in a organized fashion. Initially, you wanna think through the necessary aspects and how we're going to put those into practice. And incidentally, just as Anna said, today we're talking about the planning aspect, but then the implementation, putting those into effect, we're gonna talk about next time. So be sure you register a week from today for the implementation of what we're, we're talking about today. But not only is planning important, equally important is the implementation. You have to be able to put that plan into effect. Uh, I personally was a poster child for dilly-dallying about this because before we started our businesses uh, with my wife and son, um, in which we got up to about 30 employees and a couple of million in sale, annual sales, and before we turned the business over to our son, and he's doing very successfully with those. Uh, we, I had done all the research, done just tremendous amount of digging, very kinds of things you're probably going through today. But then I sort of sat on it. And the excuse I used was, hey, I was working full time and I didn't have enough time. But then my hand was forced into the situation because our son, uh, who was working for a construction company, reorganized and they basically cut out a division that he was involved in. So he was without a job. So I told him he had an opportunity either to go find another job so he could get a paycheck every week or we could start a business which was had a great deal of uncertainty and risk because perhaps, as you know, uh, there are a lot of data that shows that anywhere from 80 to 90 plus percent of startup businesses are out of business within five years. There are some secrets to doing that, and some of that you're doing right now, and that is planning for it and how to implement it. So we're going to be talking about that in the next two sessions, taking these to heart, and along with a couple of other things we'll mention, you have a much higher probability of success in not going under. But we started our business and we were successful over many years now, and you too can be equally successful. Let's talk a little bit about the various forms of planning. First of all, you can, you can start a business through a formal business plan, and I'm sure you've all heard about a business plan. They're lengthy, they require a lot of effort, but unfortunately, they're quickly out of date, and you really want to write a business plan after you've pretty well thought out the business. In other words, you have to know exactly what you're going to write down. Well, what do you use for planning in the meantime? 
Well, what we work with and very successfully, and this has come out of Silicon Valley and has gone across the country, virtually all of the uh, accelerators and incubators now teach the following, a lean business canvas. What the Dickens is a lean business canvas? Well, it's a one page working business plan. It's got 13 blocks and you say, oh my gosh, oh, holy cow. We're gonna walk through each one of those that aids in our thinking of the startup process. But we have to update that as you startup plan takes form. In other words, as you start planning your business, you're gonna be running into various situations that says, oops, change one, change two, change three. And you have to keep updating this. There are a lot of ways of updating it. We'll talk a little bit about that. Here is what the uh, lean business canvas or, uh, it looks like. And as a number of blocks, we'll be walking through each one of these from the upper left in problems all the way down to the lower right in how you define success for your business. Uh, there are many forms of this particular business model canvas. Uh, it was originally started by a gentleman from Aus uh, Switzerland by the name of Alexander Osterweiler. And he had about nine blocks in there. And you'll see several different forms of different number of blocks. The number of blocks is not as critical because the additional blocks are buried or subsumed in other blocks. So what we did in SCORE was to locally was to break these out in a little more detail than the traditional ones. And then we sort of teach this particular approach. Let's go through these in detail, but first you might ask, how am I gonna keep track? Well, you can generate additional copies of these and you're gonna get all these view graphs. So you'll be able to print that out and keep that. And you can either write on a copy uh, or some people actually use post-it notes and put the post-it notes on a block. And then as they change the information, as you get new information, uh, you can just pull off the post-it and put a different post-it on or add to that post-it. You say, well, why would I want to change this? Well, it turns out that in the process of walking through this, you'll find, hey, maybe my problem has changed because my customer has changed. Or my, maybe I was going to go locally and I've now decided to go statewide. Or maybe I've decided I want to change my customer base from young people to old people or include certain classes of people or locations of people or income. Of, so as you're going along, things will definitely change. So don't be afraid to adjust as you're going along. Now, if you say, wait a minute, I'm gonna have to write a business plan out of this eventually anyhow. I had to do the same thing. Uh, as our business grew, we ended up buying a uh, large building and I had to come up with a business plan to uh, get the bank to loan me about a half a million dollars for uh, a uh, building purchase. And uh, I generated a business plan, which was fairly thick. They love the thickness of the thing. I put in a lot of appendices in there. It takes a lot of time. Now, the very problem is that after the bank gave me the loan, I took that business plan and I put it on the shelf because it's too much, uh, too hard to maintain, not like a one pager that you could maintain as you're going along. Let's go to the first block. The problem. Now, this is a problem that is not your problem. This is the problem of the customer. Uh, the only thing that counts in business, you got to remember this, is not you, what you want to do, what your preference is. As I told our people uh, in our sales department, I says, what you're selling is totally irrelevant. Doesn't make any difference. The thing that counts is what the customers are buying. So go out there and find out what the customers are buying and then sell them what they want. Then it's not a sale. They're going to demand that you sell it to them because it solves a problem. Well, what's that problem? It's the biggest problem the customer has. So how are you going to find that out? You have to go out and sit down with a number of customers. Uh, the origination, originator of this technique, which comes out of the fancy term of lean entrepreneurship, but don't worry about that. It's merely going out and talking to your potential clientele and finding out what is the biggest problem that they have in your particular area of expertise. What's bothering them? And the more a problem is bothering them, the more they jump up and down and yell and scream, the better, because that problem is real 
and they're willing to pay for a solution because it's a very big problem. The bigger the problem, the better the business potential you have. So look for problems. In fact, I think it was even Einstein that said, in terms of business, if you're starting a business, don't look for a business opportunity. Look for a problem. If you can find a problem that the customers have and you can come up with a solution, you have a guaranteed business. How am I going to find out about this? As I said, you learn that from the customer by talking to the customer. A lot of people I talk to says, I don't have time to go out and talk to customers. I got to get this business started. I said, well, how much time do you have for a bankruptcy? He said, what do you mean? I said, well, if you start out in the wrong direction, you're going to go bankrupt. In fact, I just read yesterday the start, the major, the biggest problems in the failure of a business. And as I said before, like 80, 90 plus percent of businesses are out of business in five years. The biggest problem is the businesses are generating opportunities and products and services for customers that the customers don't want. They're not, at least they're not willing to pay for it. And you have to have that money to keep your business thriving. Going down the wrong track. The only way to go down the right track is talk to those customers. No matter how much pain it causes you, how much discomfort it causes you, you got to talk to potential customers and say, what's the biggest problem in this particular area? And then if I can come up with a solution, can I come back and talk to you? If you do that, you're going to be in great shape. Talk to enough customers that say, hey, that's exactly what I want. Man, you've got a great business because you've got the built-in customer base. So many times people had a business idea, got the business funding, opened their doors because if I open my doors, the customers will come. Well, they didn't come and that caused a lot of bankruptcies. You don't want that. Talk to your customers and make sure that you totally understand what, they're, what they need. Because if you don't totally understand it, you're going to be going in the wrong direction. Sometimes a customer says, well, I'm unhappy with X. You need to ask why. There's an old adage that says, ask why five times. Because you'll get to what's called the root cause. Because sometimes they'll give you the surface cause. I'm unhappy with this. Well, why are you unhappy? Well, because... It doesn't work. Well, why doesn't it work? Well, the gimiflugel doesn't work. And why doesn't the gimiflugel work? Well, because when I turn it on, it goes in the wrong direction. Well, why do you think it goes in the wrong direction? Well, I think it has something to do with this guidance over here. Oh, well, if we could fix that guidance, do you think that would solve your problem? Hey, that might. Well, if I can fix that problem and get you the right guidance machine, would you pay for it? Absolutely, because I'm just as this terrible because I can't get the darn thing to work. Well, there you go. Now, if you can figure out a solution, which is going to be the next item we talk about, you've got it made. You, the problem, though, is going to evolve. I get, I've got a lot of stories. I'm just telling you a couple of them. One was uh, the uh, whole uh, BlackBerry uh, phone. If you, if you go back far enough, the early cell phone was a BlackBerry. It was the standard in business. Everybody had a BlackBerry. Everybody. I mean, this was before the days of the iPhone. Um, and, and Android. And it was just a standard. Everybody loved it. Well, iPhone started coming into the process and BlackBerry had the lead and they could have very well stopped Apple out of business, very frankly, because Apple was kind of on the rocks. In fact, they had to borrow, it's hard to believe, but they had to borrow money from Microsoft. And Microsoft loaned them the money because they were afraid that the federal government was going to jump on Microsoft because they were too much of a monopoly. So they tried to generate a weakling in, uh, in Apple and by, by loaning them some money, Apple became a very strong company. Why? Because they did things that BlackBerry was afraid to do. They, when BlackBerry un unrolled, the, uh, unzipped the first iPhone, they told the, the director of, of BlackBerry, my goodness, these people have put a computer in here. There's a computer chip. Well, the Black BlackBerry management said, that's ridiculous. People don't want a computer in there. They don't want apps. What they want is they want email and they want to be able to talk to each other. That's all they want. Why should we do that? And they didn't. And of course, iPhone ran all over them because they had new technology. Give another example. If some of you go back far enough to the days when we had cameras that were a separate instrument, not part of our phone, but a separate instrument, there was you had to have film. The film in there predominantly came from Kodak. Kodak was the big bear of the camera business, not only making cameras, 
uh, and produce them, but their big money was in film. You may not be aware that Kodak had the first digital camera. They had, they have a huge intellectual property. In, fa in fact, that's what they're living on right now is their intellectual property. But their researchers came up with this particular digital camera and they went to the board of directors and they said, we've got this really neat new thing. We can sweep the business. We can be the first in digital photography and we'll just run away with it. And the board says, well, that's wonderful, uh, but uh, where's the film? And they said, there is no film in digital. And that's the attraction. We said, no, 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 we're a film company. We're a film company. We produce film. We don't want anything that doesn't have film in it. Go find something that has film in it. So they stuck with the old technology, pretty much like the telegraph companies when they had an opportunity to get into Xerox, uh, Xeroxing machines. They passed up that opportunity because they said, no, 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 that'll never work. Well, it turns out that companies go under because they're unwilling to change. So the whole point of all I'm saying is number four, be aware of what's happening in your business opportunities. Opportunities not only in technology, but tastes of your clients, the location of your clients, the interests of your clients. What has uh, the COVID done to the whole communications area? Right now we're talking on Zoom. Before, before pandemic, uh, before COVID, whoever talked on Zoom? I certainly didn't. A lot of other people didn't. But all of a sudden, Zoom is very popular. Why? Because the new conditions required it. So the question is, what else is COVID going to drive in the way of new conditions that may have an impact on your business? Or what will the new conditions come up and how will they affect? So you have to constantly be aware. When I was in business, we were changing constantly. Our clientele was changing. Our conditions were changing. The economic conditions, uh, some illustrations of that was that uh, we were initially into security system sales. And uh, when we uh, started going out to different businesses with it, uh, they said, uh, we don't have that much money. And they said, fine, would you lease it? And they said, of course we'd lease it. So all of a sudden, we got into the leasing business that we were never in before. Why? Because our customers needed it. And leasing became a major part of our whole business model. So you have to be constantly aware of what's changing and be willing to change. If you're not willing to change, you will turn into the Kodaks and Blackberries of the world and you'll go down the tubes. After you have probably, after you have very well defined the problem and spend a lot of time on that problem, let me give you a quick story. Uh, Einstein was uh, asked uh, if there was a meteor going to hit the earth in one hour, what would you do? And Einstein said, I would spend 55 minutes defining the problem and five minutes solving the problem. In other words, you have to totally understand the problem. I'll give you another quick illustration. I started out in, in, as an engineer. And when I was in school, there's some exams that I did beautifully. I mean, I, my answer was just perfect. Unfortunately, I didn't read the question well enough. And my answer was perfect, but for a different question. I didn't read the question. So read the question, define the problem really, really accurately before you work on the solution. And that solution that I mentioned is from this lean entrepreneurship process of learning from the customer and having it accepted by the customer and then modified in time, as I've mentioned, by the customer as you're going along because that definitely will be modified. Next step is after you have a problem and you have a solution and you've gone back to the, uh, to the customer, and said, what about this one? And they said, well, uh, I need, you, go, you, you do what's called pivoting. You go back and you redesign your solution. You come back and you say, how about this one? And until they finally say, that's exactly what I need. Great. Give me a check. Give me a purchase order. Get, make them commit because they may say just to get you out of there. Oh, this is wonderful. No, no, no. Give me a commitment. And, and you get that commitment and you get enough of those commitments and you're all set to go because even if you had to go get money, if you can take all of those commitments to a bank or to a uh, individual to try to get money, you have a much reduced risk because banks are not interested in loaning to startups because of what I mentioned before, the high failure rate. But if you can reduce the risk, 
And the way you can do it here is have those orders in hand. Um, I had I went one time uh, you know, to, to my banker and I said, here, I've got this contract. And they said, of course, we'll loan you the money because you got the contract. We know that money is coming in. They, of course, they made me set up a, uh, a bank lockbox. In other words, the check from the customer went to the bank first and they took their payment out and then gave me the rest of it. But they knew that there was very little risk. That's why they were happy to give me the money. They don't like risk. So get commitment from the customer in terms of, of, of order, and then you're on your way. So you've got problem, you got solution. Question is, who is your customer? And you got to decide. You, you can't say everybody's my customer because if you said everybody's my customer, you don't have enough money to go out and approach all the customers in the world. So, okay, fine, fine. I'll just say all the customers in New Mexico. Fine. Do you have enough money to reach every customer in New Mexico? Probably not. Therefore, we have to limit it by customer segment. Am I going to go talk to the young people? Am I going to talk to old people? Am I going to talk to only married, single? Am I going to talk to people in, in, in the South Valley or the Northeast Heights? Or am I going to talk to uh, per people with a particular income level? Once you know that, you can start designing what's called an ideal customer. In other words, if I had to say, who is my ideal customer? Define that. How old are they? What do they look like? Where do they live? And if you can just, just that ideal one, you may say, well, I got additional. Well, that's okay. What is the ideal customer? Then the question becomes, how do I reach that ideal customer? If I can reach them by, do I reach them face-to-face? -face? Do I reach them from some advertising campaign, door hangers, or over some sort of a media, social media campaign? Whatever it is, how do I reach that ideal customer? When I was a kid, the old adage was, if you're hunting birds, you got to go where the birds are. So if you want your customers, you got to go where the customers are. And you want to go where the customers will buy. You don't want to go just to everybody. In other words, it's much more efficient to use a rifle than it is to use a shotgun. Go where the customers are and specifically approach those particular customers. And you're going to have a much more successful. But if you can define your ideal customer, you know how to reach them, that becomes your major input into your marketing plan. Your marketing plan is no more, how am I going to reach them? And how am I going to convert them? from customers to buying patrons. It's that, it's that marketing funnel from the general down to the specific. And the specific is when they give me a check or their credit card, that's what I want. So you want a very happy customer who will part with their money because you're solving their problem. Okay, let's go on then to say, what is it that I'm going to provide? Am I gonna provide a product? And the question is, am I going to make that product or am I going to buy that product for resale? If you say I'm going to make it, there's a whole series of issues relating to manufacturing. And obviously, if you're going to make it, you're probably pretty knowledgeable in the manufacturing arena, or you can find people to make that for you. You can buy that through a kind of a subcontracting arrangement or buy that from vendors if it's a particular product that's already made. But there's a whole series of questions here about contracting and vendors. When you get to that point, we're going to mention something later on. Make sure you talk to your uh, mentor or to your counselor about that because a lot of them have been there, done that, and they can help you with that in terms of protecting you from the uh, issues of that situation. If it's a service, how am I going to handle that service? Am I going to have to have my own people? Am I going to subcontract a service organization? If I have my own people, do they have to have certifications? Do they have to have licenses? In my case, for example, to, for us to start our business, I had to be a licensed contractor in New Mexico. So I'm both a, a general contractor and an electrical contractor. Uh, but believe it or not, as an electrical contractor, I'm not allowed to touch a single thing of an electrical nature. I have to have technicians uh, journeyman to actually do the work. So in each case, you have to take a look at what is required in my particular service arrangement. Perhaps there's no uh, certifications, but you may want certifications to make yourself appear more valid. Or am I going to provide this product or service? 
Am I going to have to have a storefront? And if you do, you want to definitely contact your counselor or your mentor to talk about everything from a build out to lease arrangements to where to locate, et cetera. But if I have to, if I can do that online, that's wonderful. Am I going to do that through Amazon or am I going to do that through my website? Am I going to do that through a uh, particular uh, website uh, service organization that would help me do that? So think through all of these aspects. Next block is a unique value proposition. Very fancy term. What in the world does that mean? All it means is how valuable is it to the buyer? As I mentioned before, if they have a major, major problem and they say, my goodness, if you can solve this problem, this is what fantastic. You have a value proposition because they're going to love it. Now, the uniqueness of it is another matter. How can I offer it so that nobody else does? Is it because I've got the patent, intellectual property, probably rare, but it's possible? Is it because I have a place where nobody else has a place? I'm, for example, I'm in Rio Rancho and long, far area where nobody else of this capability is around. So I have a unique situation there. Is it because I can provide the service 24 seven or I can be available on the weekend or, or because I will uh, provide uh, a particular kind of service that nobody else is doing. If you can find a unique aspect to that value proposition, you are in great shape. Uh, Warren Buffett, for example, loves to invest in companies that have what he called a moat around their business. In other words, they're protected because they're unique. So he does things like, for example, he gets into things like Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola has a proprietary process, which they protected very well over the years. So nobody can really duplicate Coca-Cola because they can't seem to figure out all the constituents. He loves to invest in railroads like uh, Union Pacific because Nobody else can run on their rails without their permission. So they have a moat in a sense. If you can find a moat around your business, you're fantastic. If you can't and you're into a general area, find a way to distinguish yourself from others in this process. One of the ways that people tend to say is, well, I'm cheaper. Be very careful of that. When we were in business, we told people right up front, we are not the cheapest alternative. We have the highest quality and we're responsive and we can do it professionally. Uh, so we had a lot of other characteristics. But if you say I'm the cheapest, you quickly start going a race to the bottom and you potentially run out of business because you run out of cash. And we're gonna be talking about that later. What's your competitive advantage? Competitive advantage is no more than how can you win over your competitors? It might be on some of the things I touched on before in terms of where, when, how I'm doing some of this, or because I can do I can do a stainless steel welding that other people can't do, or I can do a particular process that other people can't do. What's your competitive advantage? Think about that, and that separates you from your competitors. Now, how can you protect yourself from those competitors? One of the ways is this moat that I mentioned before. If you can do that, you are in fantastic shape because you're going to own that particular area of the industry on your own. And if you can't, just become the first into it. Uh, there's an old thing, uh, adage about being the first, first, for, uh, first place ownership. You are the first in the area to jump into a particular area. And although you don't have any proprietary uh, protection in it, you become the matter of choice as long as you don't goof it up. Stay in front of it. Stay with very, very happy customers, and you actually have it made. Let's talk a little bit about marketing and sales. We talked about reaching the ideal customer. The very, the very uh, best, believe it or not, is the, in a sense, the cheapest, and that's face-to-face. -face. I've talked to many, many people, and if you can get your customers to talk to other people, and they will, whether you want them to or not, and if you screw up, they're going to tell them, tell all these other people what a terrible outfit you are, and nobody's going to come to you, and you're going to be in big trouble. On the other hand, if you have very happy customers and you keep them happy, they're going to be telling everybody around, look what a fabulous thing I did. Look how smart I am. I picked ABC Company, and they did this for me, and boy, am I happy. Uh, I just had an illustration from our son the other day 
who was sitting down with a client who uh, for the very first time, and they were saying, well, we're not sure. We... A, a friend walked in the door, another business owner, and that the customer, potential customer knew. And they said, uh, you, do you know uh, Steve over here? And they said, oh yeah, they, he does all of our work for us. And, and he's, well, how do you feel? He's, boy, we're really happy. Steve told me that that initial customer they approached, there was no more negotiations. There was no more discussion. They said, okay, when can you get started? Uh, so face-to-face -face recommendations from your customers is fantastic. Another sidebar is if you have a website, and we recommend, we'll be talking about that in the second uh, seminar, you have a website, make sure on that website you put endorsements from your happy customers. Uh, ABC company did a fabulous job. Or are we happy with them? Or we contacted them and they were out immediately. Or whatever it is, just one or two sentences. Put those endorsements on your website. That becomes a big factor in new clients because new clients don't trust you because you're biased, but they will trust their peers. And if the peer says, boy, are they great, you got it made. So face-to-face, -face, keep happy, happy customers. And that's a big factor, but there's a lot of other ways of reaching customers. Some of which is advertisement. Uh, we already talked about the word of mouth. And then the question becomes, okay, in, in the reaching customer, it could be everything from formal advertisements to social media. Could be many, many ways. Depends upon your particular industry. And what we did was we experimented, low cost, lots of different techniques. And the one that worked, we went after. The ones that didn't work, obviously, because they were inexpensive, we dropped. So keep experimenting. In fact, business can be viewed as a whole series of experiments. The more experiments you try, the more you're going to find that successful venture, and that's the ones you want to go after. How do you close the sale? You can have all the advertising in the world, all the recommendations in the world, but you have to think about, how am I going to close that sale? How am I going to get them to sign the contract? How am I going to get them to give me their credit card or their cash or their check? How do you close? You got to think about closing that sale, because if you don't, all the advertising in the world is wonderful, but unless you get that cash or that credit card or that check, you can't stay in business. Let's talk about resources. And there are a lot of resources, but believe it or not, the most valuable one is time. People say, well, I, I, I can manage my time. That's fantastic. So take a look at how do you go after your time? Do you pursue the things that are important or urgent? So what's the difference? Urgent is the things that keep rapping at your door. You know, say, hey, fix this, fix this, or, or your phone calls, or your email. Um, and so that, those are urgent. What's really important is the important thing to service the customer, is the important thing to install that particular installation, is the important thing to get that sale made, is the important thing to collect on that sale. What is the important things? And then focus on it. The way to do this also is at the end of the day, Think to yourself, how did I use my time today? Did I use it on urgent things? Or did I use it on important things? So make a list, prioritize, and then go after it day by day. Financial resources obviously is a key resource. And we're going to be talking in the second uh, seminar on cash and how you calculate the amount of cash you have to have and in cash management. But cash, like blood in your body, is critical for life. You run out of blood in your body, your body's gonna die. You run out of cash in your business, your business is gonna die. Why? You can't afford to pay your bills. You can't pay your people, you can't pay your vendors, you can't pay your rent, or whatever, you're out of business. So make sure you do cash management, but we'll talk more about that. Am I gonna have to have brick and mortar? We talked a little bit about that. If you do, make sure you talk to a counselor or your mentor to talk about that because many, many aspects of that. Am I going to have to have employees? A lot of people don't to begin with, but eventually you do. And if you do, again, you want to talk to a mentor or counselor because there are so many aspects of hiring, firing, and management of employees, along with all of the insurance, taxes, et cetera, of employees. Employees provide you the leverage. There's only so many hours in a day and a week that you can work and you got to have a little bit of time to sleep and eat. Uh, and, and as a businessman and a lot of people I know, we just 
push the wall to the wall on that, but employees give you leverage. So you have to have employees if you're going to grow the business. If you're going to have vendors, vendors could be everything from they're going to supply you with the product, they're going to provide you with the service, they're going to provide you with the website, whatever it is. Vendors are critical to your success. And you want to have good relations with those vendors because the vendors, when things get you know, flush, they will select who they want to work with and who they don't want to work. If you've been a problem child, they're just going to say, I'm sorry, but we're not going to do business with you anymore because you're a real slow pay uh, and, and whatever. But make sure you have relationship with your vendor that you can work with them. And a lot of vendors will, once you establish a relationship and you say, hey, I've hit a rough spot and I'm going to need to pay you instead of 30, 60 or 90. And they're going to say, how long is this going to last? And say, well, it looks like it's going to last about three months or six months where and then we'll get back to 30, they're probably going to go along with you because they have established a relationship with you. So establish a close relationship with those vendors. Quick story is uh, on our with our bank early on, I used to call on the bank about once a quarter, so thereabouts, and I had a relationship with a vice president of the bank. And I just drop and say, hey, I don't need any money, but I just want to let you know, hey, here's what's happening in the business. We got these contracts and we've hired this order. And just a few minutes, and he says, oh, that's great. Thank you. Goodbye. And when I went to the bank and I said, hey, I got this major, major contract. It was much bigger than, than we were. Typically, people say, hey, you, you can't swallow a whale. That particular guy says, how much money you need? And I says, great. So we went off and, and did the job. He was happy. We were happy. Made money out of the whole thing. And everybody was happy because I was taken the time to establish a relationship with the vendor. There, with all of these things, there is a alternative for you. You say, hey, this is too complicated. Make sure that you create a relationship with a counselor, a mentor, or multiple people in that area to help you. You're not alone. There are a lot of people who want to make sure that you succeed. So they're out there. We're going to be talking about that at the very end of the, of the session. One of the blocks is risk. And there are risks to everything you do. Uh, one of the things I recommend you consider is writing down the worst and the best situation. In other words, what's the worst thing that could happen? Could the roof fall in? Could my, uh, my partner quit? Could my, uh, my, my top uh, manager, or my best employee quit? Uh, what could happen? So what you want to do is write these down. What are the worst things that can happen? And what would I do about it? So you plan ahead of time. Uh, Johnson & Johnson had a terrible situation uh, many, many years ago uh, when uh, they had one of their uh, drugs uh, with, that somebody put some poison into and actually killed some people. And all of a sudden, uh, they were in deep, deep yogurt. So what they had, they just pulled the plant off the shelf what they did is they jerked all of the product off the shelf. This was in early days. And as a result of all of this, you now get all of your drugs with a sealed lid on it, in a sense, inside the cap uh, that is sealed. So you can tell whether anybody's gotten into it or not, uh, whether that seal is uh, punctured. If it is, you throw it away uh, or take it back. Uh, but they came out of that thing because they had a plan. They went through it immediately, figured out a solution, put it back on the shelf, and they came out with kudos and had greater sales after their situation than they had before the situation. Why? Because they had a plan. Next item is, what's the best situation that could happen? And you say, why in the world would I ever worry about the best situation? Let me give you an illustration. There are, if you have a rapidly expanding business, you say, man, I really hit the jackpot. I mean, this thing is just going to town and I've got, I've got to pump product out as fast as I can. Typically, when you sell something, unless you're a cash business, people are going to say, hey, um, bill me and I'll pay you in 30 days. Well, it turns out that you have to pay your bills within 30 days. You have employees, they want to be paid weekly or every other week. And they say, give me that check. You can't say, well, I don't, I don't have the money to give you, uh, Mr. or Ms. Employee, because I haven't been paid. That's not going to cut it. Same way with a vendor. They're going to say, wait a minute, I want my money. So if you had the very best situation that is a rapid expansion, you could in effect go broke 
bankrupt because you were too successful by not watching your cash flow. You say, well, I'll just go out and borrow some. The question is, can you borrow that much for a startup business? That's the question. We'll talk more about funding in the next uh, session next week. Make sure for both of these I mentioned, have a written plan. Write it down. You say, well, I got it in my head. No, no, no. Write it down. It turns out when you write something down, it affects a particular part of your brain that locks you in. If you think about something, it'll be there today and gone tomorrow. If it's written down, it's there for your review and you can do it. You say, well, I forgot. It. There it is. Write it down. What you want to do is you can remediate or reduce some of these risks by a number of things. One number one of which is redesign. So for example, if I say, well, I've got a dangerous process in my particular uh, operation. And uh, so what I could do is try to redesign that out. So instead of making it a dangerous situation, I redesign it so that it is less significant, less dangerous. Another way of doing it is by subcontract, uh, by uh, shifting that risk through subcontracting or insurance. Subcontracting just says, somebody else can do that dangerous thing and I'm gonna pay them to do it and let them take the risk involved. And they'll provide that to me. It may cost me just a little bit more, but then I don't have to worry about the risk or say, hey, I'm willing to take the risk, but I'll get covered with insurance. So that's another way of mitigating this risk. But risk is always a major element. All of, the pro all of these blocks we've talked about finally come down to money. We talk about how much am I going to have in sales? How much money is coming in and how much money is going out? And what's left is profit or loss. Think about this as a barrel uh, of, of uh, liquid, and that liquid is cash. You're going to put some cash into the barrel to begin with uh, as the initial funding for the business. And then that level goes up with sales and down with costs. You never, never, never want to let that level get down to zero. In other words, you have to keep a positive cash flow. As that level goes up, that means sales is greater than cost. It's called profits. If the level in the barrel goes down, that means that the sales were not as much as cost. Costs were greater, and I end up with a loss. Well, and you, and, and when you have a loss, you have to dig that out of your pocket. You have to have that additional money. And most businesses to begin with, certainly ours and most others, started out with losses until you can get what's called break even. And that is when the money coming in is equal to the money going out, and then you're okay. But you have to sum all of those losses and you have to have that cash in hand before you start the business. And we're going to talk about that in detail next time. You want to stay cash positive to as much as possible, because obviously if you're cash negative, you got to dig in your pocket. The way you do that is something called an income statement. An income statement is no more than a keep a record of what's coming in and what's going out. Here's just a very simplistic income statement. It shows revenues at the top, in this case, sales, interest revenue, and total revenue. That's how much money came in. Expenses, how much money is going out? The cost of goods sold, selling expenses, GNA, all the administrative and things of that sort, whether this is uh, utilities or administrative labor, et cetera. I may have some interest expense. There's my total expenses, what's going out. So my money coming in was greater than my money going out, so I have a profit. If the revenue was less than money going out, this becomes a loss. So we, we keep track on an income statement. It's also called a P&L or profit and loss statement. We'll talk more about that again next week. Believe it or not, one of the most important blocks is the last block. And the last block is in the lower right-hand corner. It's called a success factor. What does that mean? It says, what do I really want out of business? Do I want to make a lot of money? Do I want to have a business I can pass to my kids? Do I want to do something for the community? Do I want to become a source of jobs? Do I want to make people better off in this particular era? Whatever it is, it doesn't make any difference. Have a very strong driver. Why? Because you're going to hit a lot of bumps in the road. And the first bump in the road, you may derail you, 
when you say, oh my God, this is a hell of a lot more trouble than I didn't realize, you're gone. You'll be one of those 80 to 90%. But if you have a strong enough reason that's going to keep you on track, then you're going to be in great shape. Viktor Frankl, famous, famous author uh, who uh, wrote a book on uh, man's search for meaning. He was a uh, prisoner of war in uh, World War II of the Germans. Uh, he was an Austri Austrian uh, uh, psychologist. And he wrote this book. But the essence of the book is if you have a strong enough why, you can withstand any how. So if your why is so strong that any bumps in the road will not derail you, you're going to be in great shape. Question is, how do I keep score? Well, you have to keep score just like a, you know, in a football game, they keep the score of the on the scoreboard. You have to know, am I moving toward my success objective? If my objective is to pass this on to my kids, am I training the kids to really understand this? Have I opened their eyes? to what it takes. If it's making a lot of money, I can keep score on my income statement. If it's doing something for the community, it might be the number of jobs that I've generated. But you gotta keep score in this particular area. But when you have any incremental measures of success, celebrate them, no matter what they are. I got one new job, like fantastic, big celebration. Hey, we've now overcome uh, and we've just achieved break even. In other words, more money's coming in than going out. Celebrate it because you can't keep your nose to the grindstone forever without looking up. And we'll be talking about that. And there's something in that particular arena called E Myth. E Myth is a whole series of books that look at working on your business rather than spending all your time working in your business. Most entrepreneurs are turning a crank 24 7 and they don't stand back. We're gonna talk about how you stand back and take a look at your business to make sure that you're still going in the right direction. And when you do, you wanna celebrate with a, a celebration of success. Now we've talked a lot about the whole operation of planning, but you gotta put that into action. Uh, I'll, I'll give you a quick illustration of that. If there were five frogs sitting on a log and Three of them decided to jump off. How many would be left? Well, a logical answer is five minus three is two, must be two. And the answer actually is five. Why? Because five decided to jump off, but they didn't jump off yet. So until you jump off, you're not implementing the plan. And we're going to be talking about that next week, the whole period on implementing the plan and all the things that go with it that you have to do to put that plan into action. So critical, critical, critical. Sign up for that, and we will talk about that uh, next week. We're toward the end of the session, and I uh, invite any questions that you may have. Please uh, put them into the chat section, Q&A section, or if you want to uh, raise your hand, we can uh, just let you talk as well. And we'll stay here until we answer all of your questions. While you're thinking about that, I mentioned earlier that there are several resources that you can use. Obviously, the SBDC does a fantastic job with their counselors, and they're statewide. Uh, SCORE uh, has three chapters, uh, Albuquerque, Santa Fe, uh, and Las Cruces. Uh, West, the Women's uh, Business Center, has several locations around the state, as does the Veterans Business Outreach. So each one of these has people that can sit down with you and work with you in terms of helping you make your business successful. Don't pass up those opportunities. The price is right. And those people have been through this. Uh, they've had their uh, problems and issues and they've solved them. Take, a, take care to make sure that you get the benefits of all of those. With that, we'll turn it back to Anna and see if she has anything to say about the uh, network. Thanks so much, Vic. That was a great presentation. We uh, appreciate all the valuable information. And I just wanted to uh, let all attendees know that I've chatted through the link, the registration link for the second part of the series, which is happening next Thursday at noon. So if you click on that, you can go ahead and get registered right away. And uh, just want to encourage you to please visit our website at NMSB.
ncpdc.org to view our upcoming no-cost webinars or to sign up for no-cost counseling services. I'll also send a follow-up email to you with this information. And uh, thank you so much all for your attendance. I don't see any questions in the Q&A. Vic, is there anything that you want to end with? Any last words? Uh, no, I think that uh, be sure you take all of this into account. Uh, it's a lot to absorb, but uh, cogitate, think about it, but be sure you ask questions because just as I said, you have to fully understand the problem of the customer. You need to fully understand what's involved in starting a business. The more you understand that, the higher the probability you're going to be successful because you're going to go in with your eyes open. You're going to go in fully prepared. And if you don't, you know very well, like a lot of other things, if you're not prepared and you jump in the deep end of the pool without knowing how to swim, you could be in trouble. A lot of people here to help you. Love to help people become successful. Love to see that. So uh, see you next week. And um, be sure to uh, be thinking about your questions and uh, be sure you ask them next week as well. Awesome. Bye. Thank you so much. We look forward to next week and have a wonderful weekend in the meantime. Thanks so much. Bye now.